We're in the middle of a series on hearing God when you're hurting. And I want us to look at Psalm 69 today because it is a story of a man who is in deep water. He's in deep trouble. Vance Hafner used to say, when you're neck deep in alligators, it's no time to talk about draining the swamp. And here's a man who's neck deep. He's about to go under. This is a messianic psalm, and yet it is a psalm that applies to us. It is written by a man who is in trouble, but is also messianic, and that it applies to Jesus, and many of the verses are obvious references to what Jesus went through. Psalm 69 is the most quoted psalm in all the psalms, except for the 22nd psalm. James Montgomery Boyce says there are three things you need to remember when you study this psalm. First of all, you need to remember David and his situation. David is writing about something he's going through. Secondly, you need to remember the Lord Jesus because he is pictured in this psalm in various ways. But the third thing you need to remember is not only David and not only the Lord Jesus, but you need to remember your own times of trouble and trials and adversity because this psalm applies to you too. The psalmist says, Save me, O God, for the waters have threatened my life. I have sunk in deep mire, and there is no foothold. I have come into deep waters, and a flood overflows me. I am weary with my crying. My throat is parched. My eyes fail while I wait for my God. Those who hate me without a cause are more than the hairs of my head. Those who would destroy me are powerful, being wrongfully my enemies. What I did not steal, I then have to restore. The man who writes this psalm in a very real way is saying, what I'm going through is not right. It's not fair. I'm having to pay for things I didn't steal. I'm having to go through things that I don't deserve. And there are three words that I want to give you along verses 1 through 9. The first one is in verses 1 through 3, the word overwhelmed. Some of you are here today and you are overwhelmed by life. The second word is in verse 4. He was outnumbered. Sometimes we begin to get the feeling that it's us against the world, that we're the only ones that care. We get that Elijah complex of, I'm the only one left standing for God. And the third word is in verses 5 through 9, outcast. Outcast. Here's a man who is overwhelmed, outnumbered, and he feels like he's an outcast. Now one of the hardest things for us to do, especially as men, is to admit when we're in this kind of shape. It is hard for a man because man's ego says we have to be tough and in charge and on top at all times. It's, it's hard for us especially to say, I'm overwhelmed. I, I feel like an outcast. I'm in trouble. I, I don't know what to do. I don't know where to turn. But this man is honest enough to share what's really going on in his life. He doesn't pretend. He doesn't gloss over and that's why we love the Psalms, because oftentimes the psalmist expresses what we feel, but we're afraid to express. And so the first thing I want you to see is a cry of desperation. In verses 1 through 5, the psalmist is crying out in despair. He feels like he's drowning. He's got water up to his neck. He can't get any sure footing. The water is too deep. He's outnumbered. He feels like his enemies are more than he can count and he's exhausted and he's worn out. He is overwhelmed. Now that sense of being overwhelmed can come in a lot of stages in life. It can come, I remember the first time I ever felt overwhelmed. I was in middle school, and you know, it was junior high then. That dates me a little bit, but it was junior high then. And in junior high was 7th, 8th, and ninth grade. So when you went to the 10th grade, you went to high school, which... You would just pray in ninth grade for a growth spurt, you know. 
But I remember that we were so crowded in our school that they picked 125 people out of my class and said, you are all going to the high school your ninth grade year. Not one of the people who I hung around with, grew up with, or went to church with was in that 125. And I remember walking around and seeing Thunder Thornton, who weighed 270 pounds and played offensive tackle, was the first person I saw when I walked on the high school campus. And I almost got saved at that moment <laughs> because I was overwhelmed. It can happen when you change schools. It can happen when you change jobs. It can happen when you go off to college and you find out that your teachers don't know your name anymore. You're just a number on a roll and they don't care whether you pass or fail. It can happen when you get married and find out mom and dad not going to pay your insurance anymore. It can happen when you find out what car insurance costs. It can happen when you have your first child. And all of a sudden, you begin you to realize you've got responsibilities. It can happen with a promotion that now all of a sudden you're, you're peers, but now they're not peers. They work for you, and there's a different relationship. It can happen when you discover that you're in debt over your head, and you don't know how to pay those bills that are coming in every day of your week. It seems like every time you open the mail, all you can do is figure out how I can pay off this card with this card or do that with this, and you're in debt, and you don't know how you're ever going to get out of it. It can happen when you discover that you can't fix every problem in your life. It can happen when you discover you're in over your head and you've bitten off more than you can chew. It can happen when you reach your midlife crisis. It can happen when you retire and begin to hope and pray that your Social Security and your investments will take care of you. It can happen as you're leaving a doctor's office. All kinds of places. All kinds of ways. You and I can become overwhelmed. Because it's not what we were expecting that got us, it's what we weren't expecting that got us. And that's life, because we do not know what tomorrow holds. We don't know what our future is. We don't know any of that. We cannot predict those things. Your horoscope's not going to help you in that. Only God knows our future, and we have to trust our future with God. But sometimes it seems like God allows more problems in our lives than he offers solutions. And that's exactly where the psalmist is, because he's beginning to feel like life is slipping out of control. Now, this can either be real or imagined. You can really be overwhelmed, or your feelings have gotten so involved that you think you're overwhelmed when you're really not. You just got to start putting one foot in front of the other foot and taking one step at a time and not trying to leap tall buildings in a single bound. It can be your fault or somebody else's fault or nobody's fault. And still you can feel overwhelmed. It can be a demand that you cannot meet. It can be that sense of I am weary and the size of our feelings begin to overwhelm even the size of our problem. And our feelings become dominant. And we feel like we're choking and we feel like the air is being cut off and we feel like we can't get enough to drink. We feel like we're about to go under. It's that drowning sensation that it seems like the undertow is pulling us out. And here's the fact is we begin to think if God doesn't come through soon, it's going to be too late. Can I encourage you? God is never too late when he comes through. Now, it may seem like it to us. There have been days when I thought what God wasn't going to come through, and he came through, not on my timetable, but on his timetable. But I must admit there have been those moments and those days when I thought if God doesn't come through the way I want him to, I don't think he's going to come through in time. And every one of us have been there. There was an overwhelming sense. There was a sinking sensation. The waters have threatened my life. It seemed like... David's best days were behind him. We don't really know what the situation was in this psalm, but apparently family had turned against him. Maybe this is Absalom's rebellion. Maybe it's just the rejection of his brothers who never thought he, or his dad, who ever thought he was qualified to be the king. 
How would you like to be one of many sons and you are the only one that your dad says is not qualified to come before the prophet to possibly be the king? I would say David lived without his father's blessings. Maybe that was it. But he was having this sinking sensation. He was enduring an overwhelming attack. Look at verse 4. Those who hate me without a cause are more than the hairs of my head. Those who would destroy me are powerful, being wrongfully my enemies. David is saying, I, I don't even know why they hate me. You know, why don't they like me? Why don't, you know, every teenager has experienced this, right? I mean, those of you that have survived teenagers in the choir, didn't you experience this? Why don't they like me? I didn't do anything. I, you know, I don't even know them. Why, why am I not in the group? Why don't they like me? Why, why, why do they hate me? What did I ever do to them? So they hated him without cause, and his enemies would settle for nothing less than his destruction. Now here's a guy who's not exactly on a popularity poll. And he's in trouble, and there's unjustified criticism. That's hard to take. There's unjustified suffering. That, that's hard to take. And, and you want to strike back, and you want to answer, and you want to defend yourself. But sometimes you can't because there are people who hate you without a cause and they don't need a reason to hate you. They just decided to hate you. Not that you've done anything. Not that you've said anything. Not that you've offended them in any way. They just decided they don't like you. You know, I remember John Maxwell telling the story about uh, being at his church and, and uh, the first church he ever pastored. And he said he called his dad one day because they, he was in a church where they had an annual call. And he called his dad one day and he said, Dad, he said, I think I'm going to have to leave and go to another church. He said, well, why, son? He said, because we had the annual call and six people voted against me. He said, well, how many voted for you? He said, everybody else voted for me. He said, six people voted against me. He said, son, I've never gotten that good a vote. You know, there are people that just hate you without cause. You've got to realize that if you're living, if you're breathing, if you're making a decision, your neighbor doesn't like the way you do your yard, or your neighbor doesn't like the car you drive, or your neighbor doesn't like this, or they don't like that, or somebody you sit by in school doesn't like the clothes you wear, or they don't like something else, there's always going to be somebody in our life who hates us without cause. Now, the problem is, we'd all like to tell our side of the story, wouldn't we? This way means yes, and don't look at me like you're so spiritual. We'd like to tell our side of the story. I tell you, I've been in the ministry long enough that I've got a lot of sides of the story I'd like to tell that you're never going to hear. I've been wrongfully criticized and accused by people. I'd like to tell the other side of the story. That's not my job. That's the Lord's job. I don't have to defend myself. The Lord's my defense. And if I'm right, I'll be proven right. If I'm wrong, I'll be proven wrong. I'll stand before him and give an account. I'm a lot more afraid of what the Lord's going to say to me on Judgment Day than I am about what any person says about me. Now, I remember back when uh, we had the crusade here in town and we didn't cooperate and there were some very logical and solid reasons. Nobody ever asked me. Nobody ever interviewed me and asked me what those reasons were. But I remember getting clips of pictures from the newspaper with a circle of empty seats saying Sherwood. I remember getting letters to the editor saying that people were going to be in hell because of us. I remember all that. You know what? You can't answer critics. The critics you're always going to have with you. They breed like gnats. They're always going to be there. So you just have to get over it and move beyond it. George Bush tells a story in his book, A Charge to Keep, about when he was running for governor in the state of Texas, and Ann Richards, who was known as a pretty feisty woman, uh, the Democratic governor who was incumbent running for re-election, she began to call him shrub because she said he was a son of a bush. That was just meant to slam him. And he says in the book, I chose not to respond. Now let me ask you something. Who's the better person? The one who uses the derogatory remark or the one who chooses not to respond? He says, my enemies hate me without cause. Now listen, if you are a leader, and a leader is defined as anyone who has influence over anybody, so that means if you're a dad, you're a leader. If you're a mom, you're a leader. 
if you're a boss, you're a leader. If you have influence over anybody, you're a leader of some group or individual or segment of people. If you're a leader, you have to understand that the critics never care about your feelings and they really don't care about your life. So don't cave into them. But the psalmist is honest here when he says, they hate me without cause, they want to destroy me. There's a cry of desperation. Lord, why is this going on in my life? But there's a cry of supplication. In verse 1, he says, save me, O God. In verse 3, he says, I wait for my God. Now, here's what you do. When you're desperate and you want to answer your critics, talk to God. Save me, O God. I wait for you, God. When you are under the gun and when you feel like responding and when you feel like reacting, the thing you have to do is tell God about it. Be honest with God about what you're going through. Now, notice that although it is without cause, David does not say he is sinless. Look at verses 5 and 6. Oh God, it is you who knows my folly. Lord, you know me. In fact, God knows things about us that our critics don't know. God knows things about us that our friends don't know. Lord, you know my folly and my wrongs are not hidden from you. May those who wait for you not be ashamed through me. O Lord God of hosts, may those who seek you not be dishonored through me, O God of Israel. Now here's what David's doing. David, all David is saying in these verses is, Lord, I don't want my life to be a cause of embarrassing the kingdom. I don't want my life to do anything that gives a negative witness to the cause. I, I don't want anybody to look and say, well, Look at the way he's living. Look at the sin in his life. Look at what he's doing. He, he's saying, Lord, I, I don't want to bring shame to your name. I don't want to blow my witness. I know you know my folly. You know my wrongs. You know what I'm really like. You know what I'm really dealing with. And, and, and I, but I don't want to bring shame to you. Can I say that if that were our attitude, we would all leave this room differently today? In what we say, in how we live. I had a man say to me one time about a member of this church, he said, you know, if I hadn't known he was a member of the church, I wouldn't have thought he was a Christian by the way he cusses so much at work. That's bringing shame to the name of Christ. It's also bringing shame to the name of this church. If you call yourself a member of Sherwood Baptist Church, you better act like it or else quit telling people you're a member here and bringing shame to the church. David said, I don't want to do that. I don't want to live that way. I don't want to have the kind of life that people look at me and say, well, he's got, everybody's got reason to do that. Look at this life. Look at the way he's living. I, I don't want to go down that path. He, he addresses in verse 8 the desertion of his friends and his family. I've become estranged from my brothers and an alien to my mother's son. Now, here's what really hurts him. What really hurts David is not only is it his enemies are against him without cause, but he is being re under reproach and he's being slandered, and it seems the people leading the attack are his family members. David is being attacked by his own family, probably Absalom. Now, a couple of things here. If you're walking with God and you have family members who are not, don't be surprised if they don't applaud you. If you're walking with God and you have family members who are not, and they may even call themselves Christians, they may even go to church, but they're not seeking to walk with God and they, you're being criticized by them, don't be surprised by that because it's a reproach to them. Your life and your witness becomes a reproach to them. Don't be surprised if they mock you for it. Don't be surprised if they don't understand. And I want to tell you, it is the lack of support of family that is harder to take than the attacks of enemy. Isn't that right? I mean, when God's done something in your heart and in your life, but somebody in your family keeps bringing up what you did before you were saved, some mistake you made that you've asked for forgiveness for a dozen times and they still won't let you get over it. They'll never let you forget it. That's tough. That's what David's feeling. David is saying, man, I, you know, I, I've just got family members just attacking me and I, I don't understand why. 
Why would my own family turn against me? But listen, if you're walking with God and you have family members who are not walking with God, get ready. If they're not doing it to your face, they are doing it behind your back. And you're just going to have to learn to live with it. By the way, you have brothers and sisters who are not doing that. They're your family in Christ. And what I always say to somebody if they're being attacked by their family who do not believe and do not walk with God is just look at the fact that you can go anywhere in this world and you can meet believers and you can have immediate fellowship with them because you're brothers and sisters in Christ and you are bound by the blood of Christ which is greater than the blood of genetics. So find encouragement in that. There's the attack of his antagonist, verse 11. When I made sackcloth my clothing, I became a byword to them. And those who sit in the gate, then the gate is the place where the leaders and the council, it's where the city leadership sat. David said, the leadership of the community is talking about me. And I'm the song of drunkards. I'm talked about in every bar in town. I'm hated. I'm despised. I'm attacked. If you show me one person who is willing to be unapologetic in their faith for Jesus Christ, and I will show you somebody that is being attacked at the frat house, in the sorority, at the job, on the campus, by a family member. It goes without saying. It just happens. That's the way life is. That's the way people are. And we have to learn how to overcome it when we feel like we can't overcome it. Verse 14, Deliver me from the mire, and do not let me sink. May I be delivered from my foes and from the deep waters. May the flood of water not overflow me, nor the deep swallow me up, nor the pit shut its mouth on me. Now Jonah prayed from the belly of a fish. This person is praying from the bottom of a pit. The word pit there is the word cistern. And it's a word for a well in which there's water in the bottom, but there's a lid put on top. And literally what this psalmist is feeling like, he is in a hole, somebody's put a rock lid on top of it, and he can't get out, and he's literally been buried alive, left there to die. And he says, Lord, deliver me from all that. Now look, there's a Christian wrestling with his feelings. That's the third thing. And he pleads for mercy in verse 16. Answer me, O Lord, for your loving kindness is good. According to the greatness of your compassion, turn to me. And do not hide your face from your servant, for I am in distress. Answer me quickly. He cries to God for mercy. But then the psalmist does something, and I'm glad the Bible, God didn't just dictate it through the Holy Spirit without honesty. God shows his people warts and all. God shows David in his failure. God shows Moses in his anger. God shows Peter in his opening his mouth at the wrong time. God does that to tell us that the saints are not perfect. And so I want you to look at the next thing that happens because it's an honest reaction. He caves in to anger. Verse 22. And I mean, this is strong language. Strong language. May their table before them become a snare. And when they are in peace, may it become a trap. May their eyes grow dim so that they cannot see and make their loins shake continually. Pour out your indignation on them and may your burning anger overtake them. May their camp be desolate and may none dwell in their tents. For they have persecuted him whom you yourself have smitten, and they tell of the pain of those whom you have wounded. Add iniquity to their iniquity, and may they not come into your righteousness. May they be blotted out of the book of life, and may they not be recorded with the righteous. What David is saying is, God, I want you to get them. I want you to get them good. And if you are thinking about letting them go to heaven, I wish you'd send them to hell. Now, this is just us. If you've never vocalized that, you've thought it. And if you hadn't thought it, 
You need to come up here and preach because you're much more spiritual than I am. Every one of us have been at a point in our life with someone or with some situation that we basically say, God, I wish you'd get all over them, and I wish you'd get them, and I wish you'd grind them in the dirt. Destroy them. Destroy everything they got. Take away their money. Take away their home. Take away their health. I, I wish you'd do everything to them that, that they're doing to me and ten times more. Now, don't look at me like you've never thought that. It, 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 the only way you've never thought that is you've been living in isolation. You've not had to rub shoulders with people. And David admits, I just like God to wipe them all out. I'd like God to get rid of the whole bunch. Lord, you smite them. You don't count them among the righteous. You blot them out of the book of life. You see, when you get angry, a couple of things can happen. One is, you'll get angry at God. But then, you go, uh-oh, I'm not supposed to be angry at God, so what I need to do is to let my anger out, so we let our anger out on those we love, who do support us, who do care about us. Because we'll never let our anger out on those people because... We don't want them to know that they got to us. So we let it out on somebody else. And this is an honest prayer of a man who has caved in to his anger, who is feeling overwhelmed, and he's had it. He's at the end of his rope. He's at the end of his patience. He's lost all his ability to control himself. He feels like he's sinking, and he says, God, blot him out. Now, the problem is... You can't pray that prayer in light of the New Testament. Because Jesus, on the cross, looked at those who nailed his hands and his feet to the cross, those who had beaten him and plucked his beard out and put a crown of thorns on his head, and he said, Father, forgive them, for they don't know what they're doing. And you say, well, yeah, but that's Jesus. Oh, but Stephen who is being persecuted and killed by those who stoned him to death, looked to heaven and said, Father, forgive them. You see, what the gospel of grace teaches us is that God's always going to get the last word. The scriptures tell us there is a judgment coming for the righteous and the unrighteous, for the saved and the lost, that we will all stand before God and give an account and so we pray, Father, forgive them. Now that is not an easy prayer to pray, is it? And it may take you a while to get there. That's okay. Just as long as you get there. That you don't live eaten up with bitterness and with anger and with resentment, but that you release it and say, Father, whatever they're doing to me is nothing compared to what my sin did to you. So forgive them. Let me give you a reference here. Romans 12, 19. Never take your own revenge, beloved, but leave room for the wrath of God. For it is written, Vengeance is mine. I will repay, says the Lord. But if your enemy is hungry... Feed him, and if he is thirsty, give him a drink. For in so doing, you will heap burning coals on his head. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. You all know this expression, but it's worth repeating. When you're slinging mud, you're always losing ground. And it is never the righteous response to react in kind when you are mistreated. It is the natural response, but it is not the spirit-filled response to react in kind in the same way when someone mistreats you. He returns to a right perspective in verse 29, but I am afflicted and in pain. He's kind of gotten that out of his system. 
had a voice that, by the way, if you're going to be angry, tell God about it. That's what he did. He said to God, this is what I want you to do. He, apparently, he didn't tell all his friends. Now, we know it because it's in the Psalms. But this was a prayer he prayed. But he says, Lord, uh, here I am. I'm afflicted and in pain. May your salvation, O God, set me securely on high. I will praise the name of God with song and magnify him with thanksgiving. And it will please the Lord better than an ox or a young bull with horns and hooves. In other words, better than making an external sacrifice. The humble have seen it and are glad. You who seek God, let your heart revive. What happens is the psalmist's revenge gives way to an awareness of a righteous God. And he realizes that his situation and his circumstances and his enemies and his adversaries and his family don't have the last word. That God's going to get the last word in this. And if you look down at verse 33, verse 33 is the key to this whole psalm. For the Lord hears the needy and does not despise his who are prisoners. Lord, I feel like I'm in bondage. I feel like I'm being attacked. I feel overwhelmed. The Lord hears the needy. And He doesn't despise His who are prisoners. God knows right where we are. He knows exactly what we're going through. And so the writer of Hebrews says, Therefore, in chapter 4 and verse 14, Since we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus the Son of God, let us hold fast our confession. For we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who has been tempted in all things as we are, yet without sin. Therefore, let us draw near with confidence to the throne of grace, so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. So I'm overwhelmed. I'm outcast. I'm outnumbered. I, I feel like life's falling apart. I feel like everybody's against me. Oh, listen, you've got a great high priest who has been tempted to respond the way you've been tempted to respond. And he says, when you're tempted to do that, when you're tempted to lash out, when you're tempted to fight back, when you're tempted to tell your side of the story, when you're tempted to make your way known, when you're tempted to lash out, boldly approach the throne of grace. You ever wondered why? Because I think when we're on our knees at the throne of grace... God reminds us of how merciful and gracious He has been to us when our lives, our thoughts, and our actions have lashed out at His Son. And at the throne of grace, we find grace and mercy, and God says to us, look at what I've done for you. Now you be like me and go do that for them. Did Jesus save us when we were worth it and worthy? No. Was there anything about us that deserved Jesus showing mercy and grace to us? No. Is there anything about you today that deserves Jesus showing mercy and grace to you? No. Because in my flesh, the Scripture says, dwells no good thing. Everything good in me, everything right in me, everything gracious in me is of Jesus. Because on my own, I want to get even. And when I get overwhelmed... I want to just start lashing out. And you know what happens when you get overwhelmed in water and you start lashing out? The person trying to save you, you'll drown him. The person who's coming to help, you'll take him under. That's why when they're trying to save a drowning person, they've got to stop them from fighting and resisting and slinging their arms because they'll take the person trying to save them down. 
God's saying, look, quit lashing around here. Quit kicking and screaming. Quit throwing your hands all up in the air. Quit fighting everything. Just let me bring you into safety. Let me bring you into shore. Let me put your feet on solid rock. Let me remind you while I'm doing that of what I have done for you in the past so that you don't forget. So that when you feel like lashing out, you just say, all right, Lord, I'm going to leave it to you. You know, Paul did that. Paul said, it doesn't matter to me whether you judge me or not. The Lord's the one who's the judge. And folks, we have bought into a mentality that's not of God. We bought into a popularity of poll, opinion poll mentality that says how people think about me or feel about me determines whether I feel good about myself. Listen, what Jesus did for you ought to be enough to pull up your self-esteem, to make you look at life from a different perspective, to make you view your circumstances in a different way. It ought to be enough because you know yourself better than anybody else and you know what nobody else knows. It's like Ron Dunn said one time. He said, if, people, if the people who loved you knew everything about you, they probably wouldn't love you. Everything that you've thought everything that you wanted to do. If the people who loved you knew that, they probably wouldn't love you. But God does. And what we have to do is find our sure footing in Him, not in what people say about us, not in what people think, not in the approval of our family or our peers, or our employees, or our employer, but that we find our approval in the presence of God. And that when we feel overwhelmed, we look to Him, and we don't lash out. Father, I ask You in Jesus' name today that You would help those who are feeling overwhelmed, who are feeling like they're fighting a battle that they cannot win, those who believe that they're outnumbered and outgunned and many of us in this room that at times want to fight back and lash out and argue and defend ourselves. Lord, help us to learn how to quietly trust in you. Lord, I pray that we would learn that we can direct our anger at you because you know what we're going through. You know our hearts. We can't hide. We need to be honest. But that we need to take our anger and our bitterness and our resentment and our frustration to the foot of the cross and leave it there. And get up with an awareness of mercy and grace that's been poured out on us. Father, there are people in this room that are feeling overwhelmed because they've never trusted you as their personal Lord and Savior and they're trying to deal with life in their own strength and in their own energy. I pray that today they'd realize they desperately need you. Father, there are some of us who are Christians and we fight back just like the world. We react like the world reacts. Father, help us, empower us to look to you and to stop lashing out. Thank you so much, Pastor, for that encouraging message today from Psalm 69. It's a psalm that we can easily relate to just feeling buried or attacked on all different sides from things that are going on right now. But telling us the truth of the gospel, the truth of the Bible, that God is still the constant factor that we can lean, to, lean on and rely on, uh, especially during these times, but forever. He's constant through highs and lows. He has a plan for our life that is the perfect plan for us. 
and we don't have to deviate from that just based on our emotions of the time, based on the things that we're going through of the time. That plan is still there and in place for each one of us. And I pray um, that that would just meld into your heart and your mind this week as you uh, lean on the Father as He takes you through the week ahead for you uh, out of fear and into uh, His marvelous life. As we close, it's a time of offering where we continue to um, tell the Lord and tell the people around us that we trust Him, we trust His church with our finances. We want to follow His plan. And so you'll see on the screen below um, just an opportunity for you to be able to do that online. Um, and so you can follow those prompts. And again, we're praying for you this week. Uh, would you be blessed as you continue to serve the Lord, as you continue to lean in and rely on Him and trust Him and His plan for you. God bless you.